Are we ready? Okay. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the final day of the Telford Muse Prophecy Conference. Now, as we proceed in these studies, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for His guidance and His blessing so that we may more fully understand the symbols and evidences that he has presented before us regarding the time of the end in which we are now living. Shall we ask his guidance in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Sabbath that is now past, for the week that we have had in fellowship and study. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that you have been providing. We ask now, Father, for your direction, for your guidance. We ask that our minds may be open. Show us, Father, the light that we need for this time. Be with us, we ask. We invite you into this meeting. We invite you into our hearts. May your spirit open our minds. May your angels attend us. May we be able to breathe the very atmosphere of heaven. Show us now that which we need to hear. Direct us so that we may have more light for our feet. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, when we met yesterday, we began to cover a subject. We're going to finish this subject in this meeting. And in the second meeting this morning, we're going to go back over several of the symbols that we have been looking at through this week. Please keep in mind that the symbols that I will be presenting, you will be able to find on the 1843 or the 1850 charts. Now, yesterday we began the premise that we are currently, like Nehemiah, rebuilding a wall. What is a wall in the Bible? A law. It is a law. Have we not seen over these years that the law has been broken down and set aside? Unfortunately, yes. Now, Nehemiah had to battle against others that had chosen that they did not wish to see Nehemiah restore the wall. So using a biblical expression, what were these opposers of Nehemiah doing? And for some of you, this is going to be a hard statement. They were pissing against the wall. Mrs. White had several very specific examples that she presented for the people of her time. But as she was presenting these things for her time, was she not more writing for our time? So when we're being told that Sanballat, Tobiah, and their confederates dared not openly make war against the Jews, but with increasing malice they continued their secret efforts to perplex, to injure, and to discourage them. Are we to be perplexed 
or discouraged when God is leading us. Never. Pretending to desire a compromise of the opposing parties, they proposed a conference with Nehemiah and invited him to meet them in a village on the plain of Ono, which Hebrew 207 tells us means the plain of the strong. Nehemiah did not accept this offer. Yet, much like the children of Israel... We are in a situation where invitations have gone out. We would love to join in study with other brothers and sisters. But many are choosing to reject the offer. Much like the Ephraimites. Despite all the plots of enemies open and secret, the work of building went steadily forward. The wall rose to its proper height in about two months, as we've seen in 49 days. After Nehemiah's arrival in Jerusalem, the holy city was girded round with its defenses, and the builders could walk upon the walls and look forth upon their astonished adversaries. This wall is going to go up. The wall is there for our protection. The children of Israel did not understand what kind of a wall our Heavenly Father was placing about them. They chose to accept the heathen rites, the heathen rituals. They did not drive out the Canaanites, from their land. The striking evidence that the hand of the Lord was with Nehemiah was not sufficient to restrain discontent, rebellion, and treachery. Now, brothers and sisters, these are not my words. You can find this at Signs of the Times, 3rd of January, 1884. Look it up for yourself. Some who had been foremost in plotting mischief against the Jews, against Nehemiah, and endeavoring by every possible means to cause their ruin, now professed great desire to be on friendly terms with them. Just like the situation with the Ephraimites, with Gideon. They wanted to be on friendly terms. The Ephraimites wanted to say, you didn't call us, yet ample evidence is given. They were called. The whole power and policy of Satan has always been aimed at those who are zealously seeking to advance the cause and the work of God. There is new light in Scripture. Or as Mrs. White could say, old light in new settings. This happened in 1888. And what happened in 1888? The light that was sent through Brethren Jones and Wagner was rejected. Of all of those that were at the Minneapolis conference, I would dare say that only three understood the message. Jones, Wagner, and Mrs. White. The advocates of unpopular truth must expect opposition from its open enemies. This is often fierce and cruel. But it is far less dangerous than the secret enmity of those who profess to be serving God while at heart they are servants of Satan. Terrible words to hear. Such counselors 
are prompted by Satan. They are time servers. The testimonies, the reproof, and the warnings of God's servants are unpalatable to them, being a reproof to their worldly pleasure-loving propensities. We should shun this class as resolutely as did Nehemiah. Here Mrs. White gives us a very specific admonition. Yet are we willing to listen? There was a point that was made yesterday. As Nehemiah was instigating and pressing forward with the work of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, we find the following. Here in Review and Herald, 11th of March of 1884. When the Jews were restored to their native land after the Babylonian captivity, they found themselves in a deplorable state of insecurity and discouragement. The walls of Jerusalem were broken down. The favor of God, their blessing and defense, had been removed because of their transgressions. And there were continual rumors of threat and invasion by their enemies. At this time, God raised up a deliverer for his people in the person of Nehemiah, who was also a religious reformer, to restore the worship of the true God and correct wrongs among the people. Was Nehemiah a priest? Did we establish this yesterday? Did we establish it clearly? Was Nehemiah a priest? Nehemiah was not a priest. Was he a prophet? Nehemiah was a man. Nehemiah was not a Levite. He had been cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah was no different than anyone in this room. When under his direction the people were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and at the same time defending themselves against their enemies, they suffered many privations. They had no courage to plant or to sow, for they were sure of nothing. And the sabbatical year which God had commanded them to keep increased their difficulties by shortening their supplies. Here Mrs. White is being very clear. She is making it clear that at the time that Nehemiah was rebuilding the wall, the sabbatical year that had been ordained of God was being observed. It wasn't just the seventh day Sabbath. It was also the seventh year Sabbath allowing the land to to rest. The children of Israel had decided and observed that they had not kept the law in spirit and in truth. Now, if you can, turn with me to 1 Maccabees 6.49. And you might say, why are you looking at this? I don't find this in my Bible. Yet, William Miller found it in his Bible. Joseph Bates found it in his. James White, Ellen Harmon, all found it in their Bibles. 1 Maccabee 6.49 but with them that were in Bethshura, he made peace. For they came out of the city because they had no victuals. They had no food there to endure the siege, it being of a year of rest to the land. This was occurring in 163 B.C., the 150th year of the Greek rule over Palestine. 
First Maccabees 653 seconds this. Yet at last, their vessels being without victuals, without food, for that it was the seventh year, and they in Judea that were delivered from the Gentiles had eaten up all the residue of the store. Throughout the time from 457 B.C. to 163 B.C., the children of Israel had decided that they needed to allow the land to rest. They were following the law of God. Now the point that Mrs. White was being very direct about at this time when the wall was being rebuilt there were many families that in the land of the children of Israel were poor. These families did not have the money to be able to buy their food, to pay their taxes to the king, but they had land. There were wealthy members of the children of Israel that took advantage of this. Mrs. White is very clear. The wealthy ones were not following after God's law. That's a hard thing to say. But... These are her words and not mine. So when you read this document from the 11th of March of 1884, Mrs. White has very specific admonitions for us. Throughout all of this, she says, Some had brought upon themselves financial embarrassment by their own mismanagement and want of foresight, But this was not a sufficient reason for oppressing them. And those who took this advantage were revealing their own true character. Are we to take advantage of other brothers and sisters? They were going directly contrary to the letter and spirit of God's command. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not Be to him as a usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. Exodus 22.25 From the outset of this meeting, from the outset of this week, the establishment has been that Exodus 20-23 is worthy of our attention. Because what we find here is the covenant that was presented before the children of Israel on that day at Sinai. If it was important for the children of Israel, is it not important for us? Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Deuteronomy 23.19 Nehemiah entered upon the work of reforming these wrongs with characteristic energy and promptness. He said, And I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. Then I consulted with myself and rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, Ye exact usury, every one of his brother. And I sent a great assembly against them, and I said unto them, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren? Or shall they be sold unto us? And they held their peace and found nothing to answer. Also I said, it is not good that ye do. Ought ye not to work in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? 
Nehemiah 5, 6 through 9. The people had departed from the word of the Lord and were following the inclination of their own hearts. Are we to follow the inclination of our hearts? Or are we to follow God? Are we to follow our hearts in all ways? Or are we to follow God in all ways? Is this not the challenge that is before us today? Here is important instruction for all who would walk in the fear of the Lord and in the way of his commandments. Some who profess to be so walking and acting are acting over and over again the same course pursued by the rulers and the nobles in Israel. Were they walking in God's paths? No. Are we walking in those same paths today? There are sins among us as a people. Love is not cherished as it should be. A cold, selfish, indifferent, hard-heartedness is increasing. And this has separated us from our God. Do you want to be separated from God? Is this what your heart desire is? That we should be separated from our brothers and sisters? Because we're right. And we don't like what they have to say. Is this the attitude that we should have at this time? This is the voice of God to you, my brethren and sisters, who profess to keep the law of God. The law requires that you love your neighbor as yourself. Are you doing it? Our faith is peculiar, and it separates us from the world. Our enemies reproach us and bear false witness against us, and if we give them the least occasion, they will reproach our faith also. If they reproach our faith, who is really being criticized? Whose character is being found at fault when our faith is criticized? Is it not God's character? No institution that God has established can afford to be unjust or unfair in any of its business transactions, either with brethren or worldlings. In no case should advantage be taken with the excuse that it's justifiable and right because the means gained will enrich the cause for God, for he will never approve injustice. God never designed that one man should prey upon another because the laws of the land justify him in his course. The world's maxims, the world's customs, and the world's practices are not to be our standard. There is a higher law to be respected and obeyed. We have a choice to make. We have to decide where we are going to be. It is a sin to be heedless, purposeless, and indifferent in any work in which we may engage, but especially that of the work of God. What does that say to you today? What does that say to our hearts? Are we sinning against Jehovah? Are we sinning against our Creator in the way in which we treat others? Finally, Mrs. White 
gave an additional warning. Review and Herald, 25th of February, 1902. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art a fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come quickly unto thee, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Revelation 2, verses 4 and 5. What church is said to have lost its first love? Ephesus. So are we the Ephesus church today or are we yet Laodicea? Where do we stand? I am instructed to say that these words are applicable to Seventh-day Adventist churches in their present condition. This was written in 1902. This was written 121 years ago. The love of God has been lost, and this means the absence of love for one another. Self, self, self is cherished and is striving for the supremacy. How long is this to continue? Unless there is a reconversion, there will soon be such a lack of godliness that the church will be represented by the barren fig tree. Is that kind to say something like that? Because what happened to the barren fig tree? Was it not cursed of Christ? Is that what we're looking at today? Are we looking to be cursed of the Savior? How long is this to continue? Brothers and sisters, it's continued for over 120 years. Unless there is a reconversion, there will soon be such a lack of godliness. Excuse me. Great light has been given to her. She has had abundant opportunity for bearing rich fruit, but selfishness has come in, and God says, I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Jesus looked upon the pretentious fig tree, the pretentious fruitless fig tree, and with mournful reluctance pronounced the words of doom. And under the curse of an offended God, the fig tree withered away. God help his people to make an application of this lesson while there is yet time. It's interesting that we find this story presented for us twice. Matthew 21, 18 to 22. Mark 11, 12 to 14. Just before his ascension, Christ said to his disciples, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even until the end of the world. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. God's people today are not fulfilling this commission as they should. Selfishness prevents them from receiving these words in their solemn significance. Self, self, self. Is that all we're going to see? Where is the fruit that Christ expects of us? In many hearts, there seem to be scarcely a breath of spiritual life. This makes me very sad. I fear that aggressive warfare against the world, the flesh, and the devil has not been maintained. Who are we fighting against? Are we fighting amongst ourselves? Or are we fighting the adversary? If we're fighting amongst ourselves, we're fighting for the adversary. <clears throat> Shall we cheer on by a half-dead Christianity, the selfish, covetous spirit of the world, 
sharing its ungodliness and smiling on its falsehood? No. By the grace of God, let us be steadfast to the principles of truth, holding firm to the end of the beginning of our confidence. What was the beginning of our confidence? 1843, 1850. The prophetic word has been the beginning of our confidence. By the grace of God, let us be steadfast to the principles of truth, holding firm to the end of our confidence. We are not to be slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. One is our master, even Christ. To him we are to look. Oh no, I choose to look at the conference president. I choose to look at these great leaders that we have. Because they're They're ordained. Does it say anywhere we're to look anywhere but to Christ? From him we are to receive our wisdom. By his grace we are to preserve our integrity, standing before God in meekness and contrition, and representing him to the world. Sermons have been in great demand in our churches. Boy, howdy. We tend to love a good sermon, don't we? We tend to love it when somebody is up there giving us the word of God, and then what do we do? Oh, I'm tired. I'm going to go home. I'm going to take a nap. That was quite a sermon. Do I need to practice it? Eh, maybe next week. Sermons have been in great demand. The members have depended upon pulpit declamations instead of on the Holy Spirit. What are we depending on? Oh, my pastor spoke. He, he, He gave a wonderful sermon. It's what I need to live by. Here's the Holy Spirit. On whom is our faith based? Uncalled for and unused, the spiritual gifts bestowed upon them have dwindled into feebleness. If the ministers would go forth into new fields, the members would be obliged to bear responsibilities, and by use their capabilities would increase. Are we exercising our spiritual muscle? Are we choosing to work just as hard for God as we would for the money that we receive? God brings against ministers and the people the heavy charge of spiritual feebleness, saying, I know thy work, and that thou art neither cold nor hot. Have we ever heard this before? What church is neither cold nor hot? Laodicea. Is there anything positive that Christ says about Laodicea? I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment and thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Here, we find this in Revelation three fifteen to 18 
God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. Two steps. Spiritual revival, spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more more abhorrent to the Lord until he will refuse to acknowledge them as his children. There's only two classes. There's only two banners. One is the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel, and one is the banner of the great apostate. Under what banner are we standing today? A revival and reformation must take place under the ministration of the great pastors. A revival and reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit lead the disciples when they came out of the upper room? Did the Holy Spirit lead Elijah? Did the Holy Spirit lead Enoch in his walk with God? At all times, the Spirit convicts us of sin righteousness and judgment. Ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. 1 Corinthians six nineteen to 20 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5.16 Christ gave his life for a fallen race, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. To him who does this will be spoken the words of approval. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. Here again, Matthew 25, 14 to 30, Mark 13, 34 to 37, Luke 19, 11 to 27. It's interesting that this admonition is found in three Gospels. The word of the Lord never represses activity. God's word does not stop us from doing right. It increases man's usefulness by guiding his activities in the right direction. The Lord does not leave man without an object of pursuit. He places before him an immortal inheritance and gives him ennobling truth, that he may advance in a safe and sure path in pursuit of that which is worth the consecration of his highest capabilities, a crown of everlasting life. Man will increase in power as he follows on to know the Lord. As he endeavors to reach the highest standard, the Bible is as a light to guide his footsteps homeward. Does it say anywhere here that the opinions of men are going to guide us homeward? That the sermons from the pulpit are going to guide us homeward? No. In that word, he finds that he is a joint heir with Christ to an eternal treasure. The guidebook points him to the unsearchable riches of heaven. We're being shown the path. We're being shown the way to these unsearchable riches. 
By following on to know the Lord, he is securing never-ending happiness. What are some of the names that we've heard for Christ? Is he not wonderful? Is he not our counselor? Is he not the everlasting God? The God that has been in eternity? Day by day, the peace of God is his reward. And by faith, he sees a home of everlasting sunshine, free from all sorrow and disappointment. God directs his footsteps and keeps him from falling. Are we afraid of falling, brothers and sisters? Or are we taking heart that Christ is there to keep us from falling? God loves his church. There are tares mingled with the wheat, but the Lord knows his own. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Revelation 3, 4 to 6. We're being given a path to follow to receive that white raiment. Shall not the counsel of Christ have an effect upon the churches? Why halt ye who know the truth between two opinions? Who said that? Who said that and when? Joshua. Was it also not something that Elijah said, standing on Mount Carmel? Why halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, follow him. If Baal be God, follow him. What happened on Mount Carmel? All day long, servants of Baal and the priests of the grove did what they considered to be their ministrations. Jumping, cutting themselves, screaming, yelling. And here's Elijah by himself. Hey, 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 maybe maybe your God's off hunting someplace. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to yell louder. All through that day, he let them do what they saw as best. All through that day, Elijah stood alone until the time of the evening sacrifice, until this altar was rebuilt with 12 stones, no mortar, The sacrifice was cut. It was placed upon the altar. And then it was doused with barrels of water. Enough to fill the trench around the altar. And in front of the children of Israel, a great fire came down from heaven. Is that what we need today is to see a great fire coming down from heaven or do we have the faith to go forward to do what God would have us to do? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. 1 Kings 18.21 Christ's followers have no right to stand on the ground of neutrality. We're not to be neutral. There is more hope of an open enemy than one who is neutral. Let the church respond to the words of the prophet. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Is this not a wonderful promise to us today? 
God's people have lost their first love. They must now repent and make steady advancement in the path of holiness. God's purpose is to reach every phase of life. They are immutable. They are eternal. And at the, same, at the time appointed, they will be executed. What does it say in Habakkuk? Is it not that we know that this is for an appointed time? And what will happen when the appointed time comes? Are we not to run when we read this? God rebukes his people for their sins that he may humble them and lead them to seek his face. As they reform and his love revives in their hearts, his loving answers will come to their requests. He will strengthen them in reformatory action, lifting up for them a standard against the enemy. His rich blessing will rest upon them, and in bright rays they will reflect the light of heaven. Then a multitude not of their faith, seeing that God is with his people, will unite with them in serving the Redeemer. Now, we're going to have a further time after a brief break. We're going to be covering several points. We're going to be looking at symbols. We're going to be looking at dates. We're going to be considering warnings. We're also going to address one more time a prophecy. Here we have six figures on the board. We have six items that we're going to need to consider as we prepare for the last meeting that I will present. Now, one fifty eight. We've covered several times. 158 is the symbol of a league or of a covenant. We've covered several times that 220 is a symbol of restoration. We have a date on the board, July 27th, 1299. For those of you that are familiar with Millerite history, this should mean something. We will be addressing this. beginning in Revelation 9.1. 490, we're going to cover several examples of 490 because I wish it to be affixed in our memories that 490 is a symbol of a time of probation. 
that it's something that we need to address. We need to fix so that when we see it, we are paying attention. Now, Daniel 8, 13 and 14. What is said about this prophecy? How did we identify this prophecy at the outset of these meetings? Here we have the vision that is true. If something is true, can it be trusted? If something is true that is presented to us by God, is this something that we need to accept? Can we afford to set it aside? All of these we have on the charts. We can use these charts to explain every prophecy that we find in Daniel and Revelation. Does this mean that either of these books are sealed away from our understanding? These books are open for this time. The question that we have now, are we willing to open the book and to seek to learn what God would say to us through these symbols? In no manner are we going to attempt to set time. But we are, however, going to look as to what these symbols will say to us as we close. Now, do we have any questions? Do we have any comments? Okay, so Ezekiel 47, what? Okay. Ezekiel 47, 1 to 11 reads as follows. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. And then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by that which looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again he measured a thousand, and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again he measured a thousand, and he brought me through. The waters were to the loins the ankles, to the knees, to the loins. 
After her, afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river there was many trees on one side and on the other. And he said unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth unto the sea, the waters shall be healed. What are waters in Bible prophecy? Are they not peoples? The waters will be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto Engalam. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, and the fish of the great sea exceeding many. But the miry places thereof and marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. If the waters are going to be healed, they are going to need a message. It is going to have to come from God because it is not going to come from man. The work is in his hands. We have the need for revival and reformation. There's not to be backbiting among us. There's not to be gossip among us. There is not to be accusations on other brothers and sisters among us. We are to come together humbly to seek the face of the Lord. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we have sinned. We fall far short of your glory. We have great need of you today. We have great need of that which you would have us to understand. Forgive us of our sins. We ask, Father, that you restore us into fellowship with you. Direct the balance of this day. Show us, Father, that which we need to understand. Guide us so that which we do may bring glory to your name. For this we ask, for this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.